My name is David Nichols. I started a group called the Society of Automation Software Engineers last year, and now I need to explain to everybody what automation software engineering is. I'm also the CEO and co-founder of a company called Loop, which I founded in 2007, which is 17 years ago now. I'm going to take you all the way back in time, if you'll indulge me, to the mid-90s. And I was a teenager, and I was making my first website on a site called GeoCities. I can't recall exactly what it looked like, except it gave exactly this vibe. It was under construction. I was learning HTML. I was viewing source on other pages and copying it in. Some of you look like you may be of the era that have had this experience. And it was really cool because it was new technology. It was also really cool to play Quake when it came out, uh, starting with Wolfenstein 3D. So this, this get, get ready because this is going to be very self-indulgent on my part. <laughs> uh, the thing that was really cool about Quake, other than uh, endlessly playing for hours against your friends, was that Quake had a very friendly hobbyist and open source customizable kind of thing. Uh, the people that made Quake released the source code of Quake in 1996 for anybody to be able to modify. They just put it on the internet. And a lot of modification tools and ways of, you could literally go in and change the code of the game and recompile it. And I did that when I was about 16 years old, which was very cool. Uh, I wanted the shotgun to be a thousand times more powerful. And I was also building virtual worlds. Like you could make new levels and you could run around in them. Like that was just what I was doing for fun. And luckily I was in a place, I was a high school student and I took AP computer science and as a 17, 18 year old learned C++, which is also really cool. So the reason I bring all these things up is these were things that were happening in the mid or late nineties, which I know it's hard for many of us to hear, but that was 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. 30 years ago, three decades have gone by since that time. And the other point that I want to make when I bring this up is that I was essentially a child and I was able to effectively interact and engage with these tools. And I say that not, uh, not to sort of emphasize that I've been doing this forever, but more to make the point that like these tools and technologies are a lot more accessible than people give them credit for. A lot of these things that may seem intimidating to folks that aren't, don't have the familiarity with them uh, are actually pretty, pretty straightforward to get into. And so it was a natural extension of that that I would go on in my academic career to study computer science at University of Illinois. But there was one problem, which was I was playing too many video games and made too many, spent too much time on the internet. So my grades weren't good enough to get into computer science at the University of Illinois. Uh, so instead, I ended up here, which is the transportation building. It's two and a half hours south of here in Champaign, Illinois. And what is housed in that building is the general engineering department, or it was called general engineering department. It's actually called now. I had to write this down, the Industrial and Enterprise Systems Engineering Department, which sounds much cooler. Um, but essentially, there was a lot of interesting hybridization going on there. This is where all the controls engineers lived. This is where all the folks who didn't fit into a particular category kind of ended up. Um, and I learned a lot about controls engineering there because that's where a lot of controls engineering was happening because that's the mixture of mechanical engineering, uh, electrical engineering, software, bringing all those things together to build control systems is very much what's happening in this building. Uh, and I, uh, for my senior project, made a robot that danced to Daft Punk. The really cool thing that I learned, and this was actually the best thing that could have ever happened to me, was, sure, I love software and all these tools. It's super interesting and exciting. But this kind of software, when you run it, physical things happen in the world. And that's what really hooked me. Many of you, you know, look at this show, like it's so cool to write code that does something in the real world. And that, that was why like this was really the best kind of detour that could have happened from like a traditional CS background for me. So from there, I ended up moving to San Francisco and working in automation. I ended up working for a small automation company, a distribution and like, like a little bit of integration just, but I happened to be living directly in the Bay Area where these amazing things were happening. So. I was there from 2005 to 2015, and during that time period, it's, it's still kind of hard to imagine. Like, you couldn't get a Facebook account unless you had a college uh, email address. A lot of these companies were just getting started, and they were building technology and businesses that were basically getting ready to take over the world. And they did during that time, and they have. Uh, and the really interesting thing about that was we were sitting there basically doing PLC and motion control stuff with all of this stuff around us. And so, uh, so much money and so much investment went into the technology that powers these businesses that, and it was just sitting around and it was available for anybody to freely use for the most part. And so what I want to do is go through a handful of these things and talk about stuff that was just happened to, we just were sort of happened to be in the midst of, and we were able to integrate those things into our practices, automation engineers.
Uh, in fact, this was our office at 44 Montgomery for several years. So I, I really mean like we were really in the epicenter of a lot of interesting things that were happening. So how many of you are familiar with a product like this? <laughs> this came out in 2007, okay, which was a long time ago now. But when this product came out, I think I was literally sitting at my computer and pushing pixels around on an industrial HMI software which was really incongruent because this device could change its screen resolutions, it could overlay things in grids, it was incredibly interactive, and the contrast was so big that I was sitting there thinking like, I never wanna push a pixel ever again. I never wanna lay out a box grid by hand ever again. And that's, I think, still the state of the art in industrial automation, but at that time, we decided to take HTML, JavaScript, and CSS and start adapting that to be used as an HMI technology. So. We wrote some adapters, we wrote some software, and we started building HMIs with HTML because it was a far better tool and it was incredibly powerful. The next example I wanna talk about is Git. And everybody here is probably familiar with the legends of folks going on site, putting their laptop on a trash can lid and programming a machine from start to finish and not going home until it runs. And what Git was invented to do was to merge and collaborate, merge all the contributions to the Linux kernel seamlessly from hundreds of contributors all over the world that maybe have never met each other. And this is technology that came out in 2005, uh, which was, again, almost 20 years ago now. But we looked at this and thought, uh, this solves a lot of problems for us. For one thing, we can have more than one person work on a project at the same time, and it doesn't matter where they are. And we can merge those things seamlessly uh, as a way of doing projects. Uh, faster and more reliably than anything that we had ever done in automation before. And that was just because we were using software called Git that was free. I mentioned video games and all of you are surely familiar with what's happened in the meantime. We also noticed that building equipment and building models of equipment in virtual world wasn't just a fancy thing to do. It actually gave us an incredible, much longer time to work on a project because the first projects that I worked on uh, which would ship to trade shows like this, the frame would drop, the mechanisms would get installed, they'd be wiring it up. They say, we're shipping the machine in a week, all the software needs to be written. And that's when you have, that's when you do your job. And you know, people that are capable of that are rightly very proud of doing it and their ability to do it that way. And I commend them and I've done it myself. Uh, but wouldn't it be nicer if we had six months to work on the project instead of two weeks? Uh, when you build virtual models and you do virtual commissioning in these digital twin tools, it just gives you a tremendous amount of more time uh, to get stuff done, which means you can finish that diagnostics. You can make the machine actually work. You don't have to watch the machine through the cracks of your fingers because you know how fragile it is when it's running on the trade show floor. Uh, I've been there and done that. It works a lot better to give yourself more time and do the work concurrently by using these video game tools. And again, they're available basically freely off the shelf. But it goes deeper than just technologies because what these companies and these engineers were figuring out is that there are different ways of building complex systems other than uh, sitting down and writing a 50 pages of Word document as your specifications. And I've written my share of 50 page Word documents as specifications. And what I learned from writing them was that they were usually wrong about two weeks into the project. Uh, or if we actually went and did that, the client would not want to accept what they had agreed and signed to, which would sort of seemed like it eliminated the whole point. Agile and agile methodologies, especially these early agile folks, they're just saying like working software is more important than comprehensive documentation. It's like still a revolutionary thought. And what it led to is like all these organizations reconsidering what does it mean to build things? How do we build things? How do we deliver business value? via these software development mechanisms. And those were really influential and important. And we saw that and we're like, we should do it that way too. So we just started doing it that way. And so I listed just four of these and there are many, many more, which we're basically doing is taking software engineering techniques off the shelf, modifying them very lightly to be used in industrial automation and putting them to work and solving problems in a really important way. And there are many more techniques too. This is just eight. I'll mention testing, DevOps, open source. These are techniques that are not they're not really that controversial. In fact, if you work in software engineering and you don't do these things, you'll probably get fired. <laughs> so like, I just need to say like, these are very, very, very well-established technologies and they do have applications. And they do solve real problems uh, at important companies and they're, they're adaptable to automation as well. By this point, it's 2017. 
We've been a company for now close to 10 years and we've adopted a lot of these technologies. And this is our crew, we're about like eight or 10 people. And we started to put these techniques to work and it led to a lot of interesting things and a lot of growth of our team because we could deliver and we could build things that nobody else was capable of because of the way we were doing them, because of the techniques that we were, that we were building. This is our team in Portland a couple of years ago, uh, five years into that kind of growth cycle. But the thing was like, even a couple of years ago, it didn't have a name. For, there wasn't a name for what we were doing. We knew what we were doing because we had just adopted it. In fact, it felt kind of obvious to us. Like it didn't occur to us that it was a different part. These are things that I had been familiar with, with close to 20, for close to 25 years. And so as we were thinking through this, this was last year, like this was literally last year, I think like a month before the Automate show actually. And we were like, what is the term for what we're doing here? We need people to understand what we're up to because we think this is really important and could be super impactful. Uh, as as a technology, as a premise, as a way of working, as a way of thinking. And what I came to think is that we're not taking software engineering and replacing automation engineering, to which I mean everything that an industrial automation engineer would need to know, which is everything mechanical, everything electrical, everything about how to keep that going. Is it a loose bolt? Is it a loose wire? Is it a software bug? That is still all an important and integral part of our practice, and you need to know all that stuff. But we're adding and integrating in a lot of techniques and ways of thinking that come from software engineering and fusing it into one thing. And the term that we came up for that is automation software engineering. And there's different ways that people have talked about this. You could talk about digitalization or you could talk about IT, OT convergence. There's a lot of different uh, folks out there that are sort of looking for a way to describe that when we're talking about it, because I'm not talking about programming PLCs using ladder logic. Like that's not what I'm talking about at all. I'm talking about something different. And so now the term for that that we've come up with and what we're using to distinguish that is automation software engineering. But as I was saying, our company is maybe 30 people. What we were trying to do was understand and label this as a bigger idea. And so two days before Automate last year, we made a group. The group is called the Society of Automation Software Engineers because what, we, what we're learning and what we're thinking about is that this is not about the technology. It's actually about a cultural change. A cultural change, meaning a way of changing and coming up with a new way of thinking about something, involves connecting and collaborating with other people who share those ideas so that you can coalesce around it. And the interesting thing was, after building a company for nearly 20 years, up to 30 people, in the first weekend that we launched Sassy with this image on LinkedIn, 100 people signed up to join the Slack group in two days. And that was the day before uh, the show in Detroit last year. And in the meantime, We've had nearly 1500 people sign up because when folks who have been doing this hear this idea, they understand immediately what it is. And if you do too, I'd encourage you to join us at Sassy. This is our URL, sassy.space, and uh, let's go do it. Thank you very much.